Hello, I'm Ben Godwin. Welcome to the Word Workshop recorded at the Good Springs Full Gospel Church. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. My wife Michelle and I have pastored the Good Springs Full Gospel Church since 1999. A spirit-filled church with a hunger for God and a heart for people. Good Springs Full Gospel Church is located in Walker County on Highway 269, 10 miles south of Jasper. The prophet said that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So prepare your hearts to receive from the Word, because when all else fails, God's Word works. Praise God. Go with me in your Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12. Hebrews, chapter number 12. And I'm going to read three verses that I want you to read with me in just a moment. Praise God. Let me show you a couple things. First, I have a big God that can do big miracles. You believe that today? Tell somebody, you don't serve a small God. We serve a mighty God supernatural God. Amen. I like this. Don't forget that maybe you are the lighthouse in someone else's storm. Mm. You are making a difference whether you realize it or not. That's why God put you here. How about this? And just like that, all the potholes in Walker County were filled in. <laughs> if only that were true. <laughs> if only. <laughs> And I show this every time we have a bad winter. Uh, listen, winter, we about to have words. <laughs> Praise God. I'm ready for Florida, aren't you? <laughs> this cracks me up. I've shared it before, but I like this. If you, if you rarely drive on snow, here's how you do it. Pretend you're taking grandma to church. There's a platter of biscuits and two gallons of sweet tea in glass jars in the back seat. And she's wearing a new dress and holding a crock pot full of gravy. How would you drive? <laughs> that ought to work, right? That's how I was driving down that three-lane hill this week. <laughs> Praise God. I want to use for a subject today, focus on the founder and finisher of our faith. Focus on the founder and the finisher of of our faith in a world full of noise and distractions how many of you know we need to keep our attention and our gaze fixed on Jesus amen I had you turn here to Hebrews chapter 12 we're gonna read three verses I'm gonna put them on the screen it's in the New King James Version so you can either read out of your Bible or off of the screen with me will you read out loud with me let's share together therefore we also since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Say that again. Looking unto Jesus. The what? The author of and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The King James says, lest you become weary and faint in your mind. The key is, look unto Jesus. Now, remember, the Bible was not originally written in chapter and verse divisions. In fact, the New Testament was not divided into chapters and verses until the 1200s. A.D. So that means this was probably one continuous text with no break between the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12. So 
when the writer of Hebrews says we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, what is he talking about? He's referring to what preceded it in chapter 11. We call it the faith chapter of the Bible. Some call it God's hall of fame. And in this passage, we're all familiar with Hebrews 11, right? There are 16 heroes of faith mentioned by name. They are Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab. How did she get on the list, right? Somebody say grace. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel. Most of those names are familiar to us. Some are not so familiar. But they were patriarchs. They were prophets. They were judges. They were priests. They were kings. Some of them were just ordinary people through whom God did extraordinary things. How many know God can do that? He can take nobodies and make somebodies out of them. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen. These were people who died in the faith along with a host of unnamed saints. He says, I don't have time to, to list all of them, but we're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. Let me show you another version of that scripture. This is, or this is Hebrews 11, excuse me, verse 13. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. We're assured of them and embrace them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. How many of you realize life is a journey, but earth is not our destination? This is just our temporary home. In fact, a Christian's motto ought to be this, just passing through. Look at somebody say, I'm just passing through. So don't get too attached to the things of this world because they're temporary. The things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Amen? Praise his wonderful name. Here's what another version says. This is the Living Bible. It says, since we have a huge crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back, especially those sins that wrap themselves tightly around our feet and trip us up. So the saints that have gone on before are sitting in the bleachers, so to speak, and they are cheering us on. They're saying something like this, if we made it, you can make it. Hallelujah. They're saying if we overcame, you can overcome. They're saying if God's grace brought us through, how many believe God's grace will carry you through? Amen. We're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and they're cheering us on saying you can make it. Look at somebody say you can make it. I like the old classic song we sing once in a while. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. He's no respecter of persons. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. He can do what no other power can do. Hallelujah. And if he able, enabled them to overcome, he'll enable us to overcome. Now, Paul in his writings in the New Testament used the analogy of running a race several times to illustrate the challenges of living a Christian life. So here in Hebrews chapter 12, this author, we don't know if it's Paul or not, says if we're going to run and win this race called the Christian life, we got to do three things. You may want to jot these down. If you have a, a pen or a piece of paper, you may want to jot three things down we need to do. We need to, number one, lay aside the weights and the sins that hinder us. You see this dude up here with a heavy backpack? That's like a lot of Christians carrying around a lot of excess baggage. You think he's going to win the race? What has he got to do? He's got to get rid of some weight. Amen? And I'm not talking about a New Year's resolution. You know, mirror, mirror on the dresser. Do I look a little lesser? I'm not talking about that kind of weight. I'm talking about excess baggage that bogs us down. 
Back in high school, we used to run a jogathon every year. We'd raise money. I went to a small Christian school, and we would have a fundraiser. And one of those fundraisers was a jogathon. We'd run every year, and we'd take pledges. You know, so many cents per mo- uh, lap, or a flat-out pledge of a donation, whatever it was. But I trained with a- uh, ankle weights. How many have ever used ankle weights before? Hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You'll know what I'm talking about. I can't remember. They're like two and a half, three pound weights, whatever they were. But I tell you what, when you strap those things on and you start jogging down the the sidewalk around your neighborhood, it feels like you're running in quicksand. It feels like you've got concrete shoes on. I mean, everything's heavy and slow and you feel like you're not making any progress. But then when you take them off, Whoa, man, you feel like you could outrun a gazelle. You, you feel like you could out jump a kangaroo. You feel like you got springs in your legs. Well, what happened? You got rid of the weight. Is anybody hearing me this morning? A lot of us, we've got some weights and some, some excess baggage we need to get rid of that's slowing us down and bogging down our progress. Praise God. It's time to take off the weights, unload, remove some things from your life that slow you down. Let me give you a list, all right? How about jealousy? How about pride? How about bitterness? How about unforgiveness? I mean, you realize that'll slow you down. That'll bog you down. How about lust? How about greed? How about negative thoughts? Hatred? Anger? The list goes on and on. Strife, bad habits, wrong attitudes, motives. Let me tell you, that stuff will just slow you down. And the writer of Hebrews says, lay it aside. That's why I wanted to sing, trade my sorrows today. Time to lay it aside. Get rid of that stuff. Because it's hindering your spiritual progress. How many of you know there's a difference between normal cleaning and deep spring cleaning? There's that normal cleaning you do every week, right? But then there's that deep spring cleaning you only do, what, once a year, twice a year, whatever? And what do you do? I tell you what, you sanitize, you disinfect, you scrub, you get in the attic and you get rid of stuff. You get in the basement and you get rid of stuff. You get in closets and you get rid of stuff. Unnecessary stuff that piles up. You get rid of it. Well, if we do that in the natural, how many believe we need to do that in the spiritual? We need to take inventory of our heart and our mind spiritually. Hallelujah. And get rid of some stuff. Dave Ramsey says, Americans have a disease. It's called stuffitis. We like our stuff, don't we? Look at somebody and say, I got too much stuff. I see it every week on Facebook. Somebody's having a closet clean out. Somebody, oh yeah, you're getting rid of stuff. Well, if we do it in the natural, why don't we do it in the spiritual? Get rid of the stuff that builds up the excess baggage that bogs us down. Lay aside the weight, amen? Get rid of the stuff that hinders you. You've carried that stuff around long enough. Time to get free. I said it's time to get free. Whom the sun sets free is. All right, here's the second part, he says. Once you've laid aside the weight, then you can do this. Run, read it with me, run with endurance the race that is set before us. I like how the message words it. It says, start running and never quit. That's Forrest Gump, man. (laughs) Look at somebody say, keep running. You said, keep praying, keep running too. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Christian life is like running a race and it's not a sprint. It's not a 40 yard dash. It's a marathon. It's not about who starts the race the fastest. It's about who finishes, reaches the finish line. The Christian life is a long distance endurance run. And Jesus said, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. We've got to have some endurance. By the way, did you know how the uh, marathon got its name? Have you heard the legend of the marathon? It's an interesting story. According to legend, a Greek messenger, and I can't pronounce his name, 
ran from Marathon to the city of Athens in full armor after fighting to announce the victory of his army against the Persians at the Battle of Marathon, 490 B.C. This messenger ran 26 point whatever miles. Now they've, they've designated a marathon as 26.2 miles. The distance from one point marathon to Athens. And here's what, according to legend, he did. He got there totally exhausted. He yells out, Hail, we are the victors! And he collapsed and he died, according to legend. But that's why a marathon is supposedly 26.2 miles. Has anybody ever ran a marathon? You have. Man, that's tough. That takes some endurance. It's easy to quit. It's hard to keep going. What is, the, what is the old saying? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. When your muscles scream in pain, when your lungs burn, when your heart pounds like a bass drum in your chest, when sweat is pouring down, what do you got to do? You got to fight through it. You got to endure. You got to keep running. And that's what this author of Hebrews says. When you want to quit, when you want to give up, you got to keep going in Jesus' name. When you feel like you can't even put one foot in front of the next, God says, you know what? I'll carry you through it. Keep running. We've all heard of legendary coach Vince Lombardi, right? He had a saying. You know it. Read it with me. Winners never quit. Quitters never win. He said, once you learn to quit, it becomes a habit. I don't want to be a quitter. I don't want to be a quitter. There's two sides of faith, and we're going to refer back to Hebrews 11, so you may want to back up a page or go across the page. There's two sides of faith I want to mention to you. There's overcoming faith. Everybody say overcoming faith. Faith will enable you to overcome a lot of things in your life. You read about these heroes of faith, all the things they overcame. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 33. It says, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. We think of Daniel. We think of David who did that. Quenched the violence of fire. We think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight. The armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were and here's where we get into the enduring part. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So we have overcoming faith, but here you got to flip the coin. There's two sides to this coin. There's also enduring faith. There's some things God will enable you to overcome by faith. There's some things God will just enable you to endure by faith. Look what he says in verse 36. Still others had a trial of mockings and scourgings. Yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Notice this. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, did not receive the promise, but they kept pressing. I don't know where some people get this notion that if you are saved and if you're in the will of God, you'll never have any problems. I got a Greek word for that, baloney. Some of these hyper-faith folks, you know, oh, if you're really walking in faith, you'll never get sick and you'll never have a battle and, you, you know, you'll just be floating on the clouds. All the, Come on, what Bible are you reading? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver us out of them all. Jesus said in this world, you will have tribulation. You might as well brace yourself. Things are going to go wrong, folks. Life is going to go topsy-turvy sometimes. But what do you do? Sometimes you overcome by faith, but sometimes you just grit your teeth and you hang on to the cross and you say, I'm going to endure it. Whatever comes, I'm going to serve God no matter what. 
Brother Raymond stood in this pulpit and I, I know I heard him say it a hundred times, if not 200. When you get to the end of your rope, what do you do? You tie a knot and you hang on. You don't let go. Look at somebody and say, don't let go. Don't let go. When it seems like life isn't fair, when it seems like being a Christian is too hard, then what do you do? You remember what Jesus went through and you hang on. I love this image, this graphic. This is on the set of The Passion of the Christ. And you have Jim Caviezel, who played Jesus, and director Mel Gibson. And me trying to explain to Jesus how hard my life is. Look at somebody and say, you got it easy. No matter how hard life is, you got it made. We've got it made. And here's what, here's what the... The, here's what we're supposed to do. Stay focused on Jesus. Here's the third part. Look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I want you to look at this again. Look at verse 3 with me. For consider him who endured. Everybody say endured. Such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Think about the hatred. Think about the scorn, the rejection, the mockery, the physical torture, the public humiliation Jesus went through on the cross. He endured it all. And I believe if he could, if he could hang there six hours on a dark Friday for me and endure that, surely I can come to church and lift up my hands a few minutes and praise and glorify his name. What we go through is nothing compared to what he faced. If he was willing to give up all of heaven's splendor, surely I can give up a little bad habit. 2 Timothy 2.3 says, Therefore, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I believe we need to toughen up. I posted on Facebook, most of you probably saw the post that we were having church. I said, let's have church. Hallelujah. We had to cancel Wednesday night because the roads were icy. Let's have church. And Brother Mike, some of you may have seen his comment, said the northerners think we southerners are wimpy because <laughs> the cold, you know, we go into hibernation. And I explained, it wasn't just the cold. It's the icy roads we're concerned about. But we got to toughen up. Look at somebody say, toughen up. Somebody said in order to be a good Christian, you need the heart of a lamb and the hide of a crocodile. I'm not going back to that church. They hurt my feelings. So-and-so didn't shake my hand. Oh, give me a break. What did Jesus go through? I said, what did Jesus go through? Came unto his own. His own received him not. He's in the world, the world was made by him. The world knew him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. How many believers are in the house today? Well, I'm about to preach myself happy. Hallelujah. Keep running. Notice what Jesus has called here. He's called the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's put that graphic back up again. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How can we do that? We can do it if we look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Other versions, I like the wording. Listen to this. The New International Version says this, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. He blazed the trail for us. Another version says he's the source and the goal of our faith. The New Living Bible says he's the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Oh, I like that. And here's another version. It says the one on whom faith depends from start to finish. Somebody say that's Jesus. Remember in, in scripture, Jesus is called the cornerstone, right? Chief cornerstone. In Bible times, the cornerstone was always the first stone laid of a building. Every other stone had to come into alignment with that cornerstone. He's the cornerstone. But he's also called this. He's also called the head of the corner. 
or the headstone. When we think of a headstone, what do we think of? We think of a cemetery marker. In Bible architecture, the headstone was the last stone of a building place which brought the whole building to completion. So Jesus is the cornerstone, but he's also the capstone or the headstone. Hallelujah. The author and the finisher. Oh, by the way, he said in, in Revelation, I am Alpha. Somebody say Alpha and Omega. What in the world does that mean? Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. What's he saying? I'm A to Z and everything in between. I am the first and I am the last. Hallelujah. The beginning and the end he's the author and the finisher of our faith he started this work in us and he's going to finish the work in us hallelujah I love Philippians 1 8 it says being confident you can be confident of this very thing he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ look at somebody say God doesn't do a halfway job I grew up on the Imperials. Anybody remember the Imperials? Oh, yeah. They were my band, man, back in the late 70s, early 80s. I had me a little drum set in my, in my, uh, my bedroom. Little, it was like a sparkly gray drum set hand me down from my older brother that he got from some other guy in the church. And I put on my record. Whew. Anybody remember what records are? Put that needle on there. I'd crank that as loud as it would go. It's a wonder my mom and dad had any sanity. That I'd jam, man, to the Imperials. That's how I learned to play the drums. And a bunch of other gospel groups back then playing in church. But one of their songs is just sticks in my memory. He didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build his home in us just to move away. He didn't lift us up to let us down. He didn't lift us up to let us down. He's going to finish the work he started in you. Why? He's the author and the finisher. Hallelujah of our faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus, folks. What happened to Peter when he took his eyes off Jesus? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Now, it's easy to criticize Peter, isn't it? It's easy to pick on Peter. He's, he's an easy target. That's low-hanging fruit right there. <laughs> yeah. Peter sunk. What's wrong with you, Peter? What we fail to remember and realize is Peter dared to do something nobody else would even try. It's better to try and fail as to not try at all. There they are. Their, their boat is being tossed like a toy on the stormy sea of Galilee. And they see some kind of figure coming through the, the rain and the darkness. And they're trying to make it out. And they think it's a ghost. They think it's a spirit. And they're, they're already freaked out from the storm. Now they're freaking out because they think there's a ghost. And Jesus says, be not afraid. It is I. And Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, bid me to come out there on the water with you. I think I can do this. <laughs> but he took his eye off Jesus. And he got his eye on the storm. And he sank like a rock. How many times have we done that? How many believe Jesus loved Peter? But why did he let him sink? How many know God loves you? Why has he let you sink? We got to learn the lesson that we can't do it without him. Without him, I can do nothing. But with him, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it was a real simple remedy. I mean, panic. I'm sure Peter was a, he was a professional fisherman. Surely he could swim, right? So what does he do? He calls out, Lord, save me. Three words turned it all around. You said it in your song, brother. He can turn your situation all the way around. Three words. Not a fancy prayer. 
Three words, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached down, yeah, <laughs> I got you. I got you. You had that this week, didn't you, Chance? Chance was helping folks out of the ditch. They slid off the road in the ice. And uh, what do you got, a four, four by four truck? Hallelujah, whatever you got, hallelujah. I got you. Praise the Lord. Look at somebody say, he's got you. He's got you. Lord, save me. You say, I've been saved 20 years. I've been saved 30 years. Yeah, but he can save you from that situation you're in. The word save also means to deliver, to intervene. How many need God to save you today? How many need God to intervene in your life today? I challenge you to lift your hand and say, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Three simple words changed everything. Matthew 14, 31, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? How many times have we sunk, but the Lord caught us? Mm. All right, I got to close. But I hadn't seen you in a week, so I'm enjoying myself. Hallelujah. Didn't get to preach Wednesday night. I came with both barrels. Hallelujah. Cocked and loaded. Why do horses, race horses, wear blinders? Horses have amazing eyes that they're independent of each other, kind of like a, some of those lizards, you know. They can see both, the same thing with both eyes, or they can be independent. And if, and if they're easily spooked by what they see in their peripheral vision, maybe headed this way, but they see stuff out here because their eyes are on the side of their head, Right? And so they'll put blinders on them to block out their peripheral vision so they're not distracted because they want them focused on the race, the finish line that's ahead of them. Hallelujah. Are you getting my drift? If you've ever been to New York, and you, you go into Central Park, they've got horse-drawn carriages pulling people around the park. And they usually have blinders on. If you go to New Orleans, the same thing. We were there a year ago uh, at, at, at New Orleans. And, man, they had the buggies lined up for people to take rides through the city streets, the cobblestones. What do they have? They have blinders. Why? Because they don't want those horses to be spooked by the crowd or by the cars or by other animals or some other distraction. They want them focused on what's ahead. I hope you're getting my drift. Hallelujah. Set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Keep your eye on Jesus. Otherwise, you will be distracted. Get your eyes off of people or you will be disappointed. People will hurt you and people will desert you. But Jesus will never leave you or never forsake you. If you look at people long enough, you'll find flaws. You'll find fault. You'll find something to criticize. Listen, but if you look at Jesus like Pilate, you'll say, I find no fault in him. <laughs> Preachers will let you down. Churches will let you down. Christians will let you down. Some of your own family will let you down. But I, I stand here and I prophesy Jesus will never let you down. I said, Jesus will never let you down. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Well, I got to close so you can go eat some chicken. Hallelujah. How many have heard of Charles Spurgeon? He lived from 1834 to 1892. He was known as the Prince of Preachers. He, he pastored a church in London for 38 years. Had a couple of different names, but it became known as the Metropolitan Tabernacle. He was known as the Prince of Preachers. This is a true story. A couple of preachers wanted to go hear some different preachers and hear the word of the Lord and be encouraged. And an older preacher said to the young preacher, hey, go with me. So they went and they heard this, this famous orator. I mean, he was skilled in his communication and he was flowery in his vocabulary. And I mean, he, he could just lay it out. He could just communicate and convey biblical truth. It'd just blow your mind. So they get out of the service and the older minister says to the younger, he says, well, well what did you think? He didn't even look at him. He just shook his head. He said, my, 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 what a preacher. He said, I want you to go hear somebody else with me. And they went and heard Charles Spurgeon. 
Charles Spurgeon is a very intelligent man in his own right. He authored books, commentaries, devotionals, magazine articles, poetry, he even wrote hymns. But after hearing Spurgeon preach, they come out of the service and the older minister says to the younger minister, well, what did you think? Didn't even look at him. He said, my, 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 what a Jesus. Get your eyes off people. Get your eyes on Jesus. Last thing I'm going to tell you is what John the Baptist told the world. Behold, look, stay focused on, put your attention on. Behold, say it with me, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lay aside the weight, hallelujah. Run with patience and look unto Jesus and you're going to finish the race. Amen. Stand with me if you will, please. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you, Lord, for your grace today. Thank you, Lord, for moving in individual lives and situations today. Somebody, you just need to call out and say, Lord, save me. Whatever you're going through today, maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's conflict in your family. Hello everyone, this is Pastor Ben Godwin thanking you for watching our broadcast today. I pray it has been a blessing and a source of spiritual enrichment for you and your family. I'd like to invite you to visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can view many more singing and preaching videos. Search for Good Springs Full Gospel Church at youtube.com. Also, please visit our website at goodspringsfgc.org where you can learn more about our church and ministry, read many of my articles on a variety of subjects, find a direct link to our YouTube channel, shop our online store, and donate to our church and help support our TV ministry with debit, credit card, or PayPal. Also, you can mail in an offering the old-fashioned way to Good Springs Full Gospel Church, PO Box 3161, Jasper, Alabama, 35502. If we can assist you in any way in your spiritual journey, please contact us. And remember, when all else fails, God's Word works.